Welcome back to another episode of RNT Fitness Radio. Today we've got something different in store for you. I'm joined by one of our clients, Mark Stokes, who's a speaker, author, investor, and serial entrepreneur based in London. He's also got a lot of experience in the past of completing ultra marathons up to 100 miles long, which is insane. He recently joined us at RNT and came to me with a great idea whereby we talk about the start of the journey and what it takes to use initial momentum and turn it into a transformation. He also flips the seat here and asks me questions that people at the beginning of their journey need to know the answers to, which is something we've not done previously before. This is packed full of gems, which is going to be great for all of you looking to start a real lifelong transformation in 2019. I hope you enjoy it. How's your day gone so far? I know it's early. Yeah, yeah, pretty good. I was at the gym for quarter to six this morning and just settling into our routines and things. So um, all good. Yeah. Okay. Is that, um, are you a morning guy, morning trainer then? Yeah, I've always been a, a morning guy. It's just in my DNA, I think. It's nice just feeling to, to get it out of the way as well and not have to think about it, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So so what did you do? Did you just wake up, go to the gym, and then start your working day after that? Or uh, do you, yeah, are you up really early? My, yeah, my, my morning starts, um, yeah, I wake up about quarter past five, um, get to the gym quarter to six, get back about seven, have a spot of breakfast with my wife, Sharon. You know, she'll be kind of ironing the kids' clothes and getting them out the door. Um uh privilege of working from home i get to drop my daughter i've got four children so i drop my uh, daughter at the end of the road to catch a bus um and then get back for our we normally have an eight o'clock monday morning conference call uh, as, as a business you know just corral all the thoughts for the rest of the day so and then uh, then calls and whatever I, I tend to work mostly from home but um probably 50 percent of the time i'm out and about meetings that sort of thing so you uh, is everything you do remotely based? Um, yeah, it- pretty much. So we run a development company. Um, I look after investor relations. Um, I'm a co-founder of it. Um, so we have a lot of flexibility. We've got about 11 uh, property elements, ranging from seven apartments through to 50 apartments. Um, and I raise a lot of the private capital um, for that. So a lot of my time is is with investors which is always a joy, really. You're never asking anybody for money. You're just exploring what makes them tick. And uh, it's fascinating talking to people about business. Amazing. How long have you been doing this for? Uh, well, I retired from corporate life when I was 45, so I'm 49 now. Um, so, yeah, it's been quite a journey. I've been involved in global infrastructure, running global infrastructure company around the world for 26 years before I before I left corporate life once and for all, and I can't sit on hands. You know, I, I'm really passionate about what I do, and I love working with people. So, so that was something that I, I set out to do in yeah the age of 45, so May 2015. So we set up this business. I've got four or five businesses now involved in investment. Uh, not all involved in property, but uh, but most have a property property vein oh, right. too. Yeah. So you were working uh, in the. Cool. You were in the city for 26 years and then you decided to quit and uh, set your own business up. Was that your first business or had you had, have you already run previous uh, businesses in the past? Well, the, the day I retired from corporate life, I resigned from uh, seven directorships of seven different boards. So I was all really active and I've been involved in uh, corporate startups, albeit under the, the global corporate umbrella. Of, I've only ever had two employers in my life, but probably about 40 or 50 roles. And I've run you know, hundreds of millions. Uh, largest single project was 1.5 billion US dollars. And that was, um, I worked out in Australia for a couple of years, looking after Japan, Hong Kong, Singapore, Philippines, New Zealand, and Australia, fiber optic networks, and primarily um, major um, uh, data set construction. And that moved on to energy, power plants, power stations. So my background's construction, so the numbers don't see me, and they're just zero on the end. Um, but it's the uh, I, I guess I'm a risk manager at heart. That's uh, that's my my core strength in running business, and also I've um, over the years um, for probably the last twenty years I've been our, our primary corporate troubleshooter as well. 
to any hellhole disaster carnage that was happening around the UK, Europe or the world. It would be me that got a phone call to say, you know, could you just pop on a plane? You know that phrase, could you just? (laughs) (laughs) Which usually meant, you know, go and grab a ticket, the PA's got it and you need to be at Heathrow in a few hours. And um, uh, and that's what led me to Australia, to be honest. Um, We had a an MD just uh, just decide to to, to to leave the business and uh, I had to go gather the troops and um, but you know investigated a lot of things fatalities um, large bank uh, long stop breeze you know many many different things so, uh, and you learn you know you you give a bit and you you take it from every situation yeah it sounds like you've got you've had your you know, fingers in a lot of pies over the years, and uh, you still continue to do so. Yes, uh, every scar has a value, Akash. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And not just in business, right? You've done a lot of um, different uh, activities and, and, and sports and different fitness endeavors as, as well, right? It's not just being uh, in business that you've tried a lot of things. Yeah, I've, I've tried, uh, I've tried things. I, I guess I've I wanted to understand what truly was the depth of my reserve tank um, in life, Um, whether it be in business life or or, um, uh, anything I set my mind to, you know, leisure pursuits, uh, to go full out to the max, absolutely focused. Um, and that I I wanted to start triathlon. I, I used to do a lot of lot of skydiving. I used to skydive a lot out of planes and helicopters in my twenties. I was in the TA. Uh, I used to a lot of free climbing as well. I used to enjoy that. Um, uh, I used to be an advanced uh, paddy scuba diver as well, mainly for the time I was in in Australia. Um, so you know, I've always try to live life on the edge and just just give it absolutely everything. Uh, I guess I thought I was probably a bit indestructible in my, in my twenties, um, and and loved it. Um, but when I when I got towards my late thirties, I really started to have a passion and, and a hankering for for understanding what I was really capable of, and that took me into initially into triathlon rather than do a a short distance. I went straight for long distance. And, and did uh, did a few Ironman races um, as Zurich and, and the UK. I really really enjoyed that, particularly Switzerland. That was a, I was a bit lumpy to say the least. Certainly the bike route. Um, but uh, I guess you know with the three disciplines, it's quite difficult. And having four children as well, I had to be quite measured on how I spent my time. Um, so my primary focus was running, and I don't like running on on tarmac getting my trainers on, getting muddy out there in, in, the, uh, in the fields and the hills. Uh, so that moved me into trail running. Um, and rather than be settling for a half marathon or a marathon, I, I wanted to see how far I could run. So uh, I've done a, a lot of ultras in my time now, uh, 20 or 30 ultras, um, which is really anything over a marathon. But uh, I would be typically between uh, 50 miles and 100 miles in a day. That would be my... My uh, sort of routine, um, yeah. The, the longest single stage event was 107 miles. I ran from London to, to almost to Birmingham. That was um, yeah, 24 hours, 107 miles. That was quite a lot about yourself. <laughs> um, and then uh, I, I did the marathon de Saab in across the Sahara in 2011, which was probably right as close to as, uh, getting to the bottom of my reserve tank as I probably hope to hope to get to be honest what was it like uh, running more than say 50 miles I mean I can't even imagine running more than 10 miles let alone uh, 50 60 you know, over 100 miles what 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 goes through your head what, what are you saying to yourself you know you said that you learn a lot about yourself what were some of the lessons that you took from you know these extreme extreme um, uh, events well, I think the first thing you realise is your body won't take you that distance. Um, you, your body is 20% and you, your mind is the 80%. Um, and I figured out pretty quick that I had to get my head around there's two types of pain. There's the pain that is mildly inconvenient, and that might be losing toenails, rashes, chafing, you know, blisters. Um and the other type of pain should be hypothermia, dehydration, heat stroke, 
the things that will really take you down. And by the time you realise you've got them, you know, it's too late. You, you're beyond uh, looking after yourself. When you're on the Welsh mountains doing a, a, a 70 miler in the middle of winter, you, you need to know your body. You need to know your, your signs. Um, but I, I had that relentless, absolute relentless pursuit. And, and if, I'm, if I'm honest with you, and, and it's something I've only really become comfortable talking about um, since I left corporate life, actually. I, I tend to refer to corporate life as, as wrapping oneself in cling film. Really. It tries to keep you all together and mould you into, into a shape that they want you to, to serve the organisation, you know, the greater need. But um, I, I came from quite a humble, uh, humble background in, in Lincolnshire. Uh, I went and did my degree, which was construction in 88 to 92 uh, in Sheffield. And in that first year, I went to see my, my first uh, football match, um, which ended up in the Hillsborough disaster. Um, and as a, as a young man just starting my journey in life, um, to then see some of those, those harrowing scenes. And, you know, when you've, when you've seen children in particular take, take their last breath, that leaves something on your soul and, and in your DNA that, I have to be honest, I, I just had absolutely no idea how to handle that. There was no PTSD or counselling or anything like that at that stage, and I couldn't tell you whether I needed it or not at that stage. So I I put that into my plus, really, in the back of my mind, a little box, really, that uh, and got on with life. But I wanted to make sure that I was leaving nothing on the table whatsoever at, at the end of my life. And... Um, that's what you know drove me, and you know after after twenty five odd years of uh, corporate life, um, it was about time to address some of those demons and really understand why I was pushing myself as hard as I was in probably not a very productive way, if I'm honest. So, when were the uh, ultra events? Were they during your corporate stint, or are yeah, since you left? Yeah, towards, towards the last uh, the last five years of, of, of corporate life, to be honest, um, starting around two thousand and nine. Um, but my my approach, my strategy, was a little bit agricultural, shall we say? It was um, uh, uh, training, you know, heating. It was pain on pain, if, if I'm honest. Um, and I, I didn't really know any different. I had, I had no background in sports science or nutrition or anything like that. But what I did have was the that grit and moral fortitude to just get out there and rain or or um, shine. I, I remember one time I was practicing for a, a, an 80 miler, and um, it was snowing outside, and you could you know you were just skating around. You couldn't really run out there you know, six inches of snow. So I just went into uh, the local gym and uh, wasn't a member, went in there and, and just ran six hours straight on the treadmill. And uh, I actually broke the treadmill belt. Um, the treadmill burnt out uh, after five hours and hopped on another one. But just that absolute driven focus. Um, and I probably now realise that maybe... Um, Maybe running was uh, more of a psychological release for me, but it also, in some ways, it was probably a contributor to the problem, whereas I was actually seeing it as the solution. Because what happened, I was getting this sore tooth of weight. Because I, I can absorb a bag of walkers crisp just by walking by them. You know, I, I have very little uh, natural uh, discipline on, on food. Um, and I can, probably in the last 10 years, I've gained two and a half stone, lost two and a half stone. And if I overlay my running events, generally, you know, I would, I would peak, if you like, a fitness at my lowest weight um, and, uh, and then put it all back on. Um, so losing weight meant running more miles. And that was a simple equation I lived with for 10 years. And now that I've met yourself and, and, uh, canal, um, you know, I, I now know different and fully immersing myself in it. Right. I mean, before we before we carry on, I think it'd be good to maybe introduce yourself. <laughs> we haven't. Uh, we just kind of dove in here. 
but it'd be good to tell the listeners, you know, who is Mark Stokes and, uh, you know, where, where, where have you been in the past and where are you now? Yeah, well, well, I, I, I do dive in. I do do full immersion, that's for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm 49, I'm married, four children, live uh, in a village called Elstead outside of uh, Guildford in Leapy, Surrey. Born in Lincolnshire, did my degree, um, joined uh, corporate life just as the as British Telecom were losing their monopoly on uh, on the copper and fibre networks, or copper, mainly copper, a lot of US investment. So even though I had a construction background, I really moved rapidly into project directorship and, and became a company director relatively quickly, looking after you know, 10 millions of, of corporate infrastructure and rollout around the UK. Fibre networks, at the end of the fibre network, you need big data centres. I was involved in real estate acquisition, construction, uh, and, and deployment and leading large teams um, that uh, started in the UK, moved across uh, uh, Europe, Middle East, um, and then across to Australia around the millennium. Um, then on the dot-com dot uh, bus start, I then what didn't seem like it at the time. I, I had the privilege of, although I'd set up a number of companies, I had the privilege um, to learn how to deconstruct companies as well. A lot of uh, uh, restructuring, a lot of closure, um, and you really have to live by your wits there. There's, there aren't many manuals that tell you how to make 400 people redundant, um, and so you have to be very congruent, very true to yourself and authentic, and, and I, I did that, you know, taking to the stage and letting people know exactly what the situation was. Um, we then, uh, a, a, number, a select few of us, uh, four of us, we then joined, uh, sorry, three of us, when joined a PLC, but um, not in the traditional way. We presented a business plan in 2001 to the PLC. Um, we injected the 49% of the initial working capital into a brand new company, which was designing, building, and operating data centers in the UK. Uh, I run that. Uh, and sold our stake uh, to the business, back to the business with, with my business partners, um, Nigel, Peter, and, and Phil, uh, and Mike. Um, and then I went on to do other things within that business. I, I was the MD of that business. I became non executive director of a number of other companies, MD of some, chairman of some, um, and got involved in quite a bit of mergers, acquisitions, moved from data centers into energy consultancy business, uh, power stations, renewable energy. But the reality was, as it closed to close towards 2014, 15, um, I, was, I was more successful than ever in corporate life. I was uh, running seven companies at that time. Uh, on the board of those seven companies, but I, I wasn't seeing as much of my four children as I wanted to, and that was a cost I was no longer prepared to, to bear. So I sat down with the CEO, and um, she wanted me to uh, restructure again. So I did a lot of major restructuring over over a nine month period, and uh, literally closed the door and, and turned the lights off on on the way out. Um, that was a pretty frenetic period of time. Uh, I probably hadn't designed my parachute quite as well as I could have done as I uh, jumped out of the, the corporate jet um, after 26 years. Um, but rapidly, I, I knew I wanted to work with a very select few people. Um, so we rapidly formed our company, Equa Group, um, which is a development organization heavily involved in property, commercial conversions and developments. I've got a number of other uh, interests in investment companies. I'm an investor myself. Um, invest in property, I invest in businesses, hours, and other people's businesses. Um, so quite a, an eclectic uh, mix. Um, and uh, earlier on this year, uh, well, for the last year, I'd, I'd had a 35-year itch I wanted to scratch, um, which was to become an author. I've always enjoyed holding a book and how it smells and feels. And um, yeah, it took me 35 years of cash to work out what to, what to write on, but... Um, Took me a year, but I eventually launched my first book in um, in September on Amazon, which uh, which is a fantastic feeling. And then um, I'm actually just started to write, starting to write my second book now as well. Amazing! And this is on so, property, right? Uh, first book's on on property, yeah, commercial to residential conversions. Um, 
which is you know one of the passions of mine. But I wouldn't say I wouldn't say it's just property. For me, I love business. I love every element of business. You know, we could have a coffee sometime and or a green tea, shall we say? And uh, talk about how you've started your business. You know, I'm absolutely fascinated with, uh, about how we start up businesses, how they grow businesses, how they scale businesses, how they bring in equity, different layers of funding. That's been my life for 26 years. And I think when when, when any of us leave a job or, or start on an entrepreneurial pursuit, you know, we all spend that moment or two of looking at how we how we can repurpose the skills that we've got. And for some of us, that takes a minute. For some of us, a week, a month, a year. Um, and, you know, it didn't take me long to to work out how I was going to repurpose mine. But um, I was born, born fairly confident, you say. So, um, yeah, it's something I've really been wrapped up in immersed in for the last uh, three and a half, four years. Amazing. You've, you've, uh, the, the first thing that strikes out to me is uh, how did you manage to to balance ultra marathon, ultra events with, you know, with living this corporate lifestyle and having four children. I mean, that's the first thing that strikes out to me because ultra events require so much time. And, you know, with, with the amount of businesses that you're involved with, that, that's a lot of time and bandwidth as well. And then, of course, four children. So, I mean, it, it, you're probably going to say there's no such thing as balance, right? But you know, I've got to ask, like, how, <laughs> what were your days like when you were doing this? Well, I think if you want something, something bad, um, uh, you don't see it as sacrifice at the time. You just see it as, as an offset. You know, there were things I was prepared to do at that time that maybe I wouldn't do now. Um, so I would, uh, my tip, as I would be approaching, let's say, a 100-mile race, you know, I'd gradually be conditioning, but I'd be running maybe on a Monday, 12 miles, Tuesday, 10 miles, uh, 16 miles on a Wednesday, 8 on a Thursday, Rest day, which would be a swim and some CrossFit on a on a Friday, and then I'd be doing back to back thirty milers on Saturday and Sunday. So I'd be, you know, I'd be pushing up to ninety, a hundred miles. But it's you know, with a with a rucksack and you know with ten kilos, fifteen kilos of weight in the back, just to add a bit more pain on it. But it was that pain on pain, um, and re- that relentless. There was no. I think I mentioned the word agricultural cash earlier on. It was pretty agricultural training. Um, was it sustainable? No. Did I enjoy it? Yeah, I did actually. That was when I first got into audio books, um, and I would just fully immerse immerse myself in in audio books. And uh, you know, ninety five percent of the population could um, could beat me in a in a hundred two hundred yard sprint. No problem at all. I, I am not built for, for speed. But um, that the wheels most in motion, and, and I'm like a big flywheel, and I'll go and go and go, and whether that's business or or, or running. But, uh, you know, my body's uh, human like everybody else's. And, um, my Achilles in particular, and my ankles, it really took a massive toll because it was all trail running, all Steep hills, wooded forests, sandy, you know, mud, all the stuff I enjoy. Um, but those twists and turns and scar tissue, um, you know, it was just not sustainable. So that's when I um, really started to, last couple of years, did my last ultra just over a year ago, did that with my wife. Um, that was her first, uh, her first ultra. That was a, a 56 miler. Um, I think she wanted to do an ultra with me because she actually wanted uh, maybe to see me in pain. I really don't know. Yeah. Um, but my was balloon, I, I didn't, I didn't adjust and probably put on three stone. Since the last ultra, you put on three stone. Yeah, three stone, and yeah. um, that's when I um, well. Uh, Session, you, you know well. Um, Dick Sesh and I, uh, we've known each other for quite a while, and we were just having a, a social social chat and a coffee. And um, you know, I, I I was realizing that something had to change, and it was probably going to start with the education and and actually trying to connect with me and my my body because I felt as I might sound weird, but I don't actually 
feel as though I know at 49 my body. I know what my body can achieve if I push it hard enough, but that's 80% mental. I don't have a problem with that. But what my, um, you know, I know we've mentioned about goals and things uh, previously. Um, I don't actually know my body's really capable of in terms of health and, and fitness wise because it's all been one dimensional. Does that, does that make sense? Would you say that, that you touched on this before, but the ultras and the extreme events were almost the form of escapism where you never, you know, like you say, you never really stayed in tune with your body and almost just thought, let me just, let me just go. Let me just go and, and, and just not think about, you know, what's happening to your body and just, you know, just go. Is that fair to say? De- definitely. Definitely in tune, in tune with my own thoughts, getting out there. De- definitely escapism. There. And it, it won my, my events, I run the London Marathon, but my typical events don't tend to have 30,000 people entering them. We um, tend to might have 40, 80, 100. The finishing line isn't on the mall. You know, the finishing line is two flags in the middle of a field and some guy's got a hexy stove on and, and getting a brew on at, at the finishing line. And, and that is that quite a contemplation of thought when you pass the finishing line of I set out what I achieved to do. Um, so it's very a very personal level of achievement. And I think if any any of your listeners have, have ever done a, an ultramarathon, um, you know, the key part, you're only competing with what you're capable of. Um, I was never competing with anybody else. That wasn't the important thing for me. Yeah. Just so the listeners know why we brought on Mark today, and it, it was an idea that Mark had, and he reached out to me and said it'd be, it'd be great to bring on someone who's new to the journey and talk about what it, what you, the mindset you need to have to achieve a body transformation goal and some of the questions that new people to the journey may have that they don't know that they have or you know to unlock some of the knowledge that they need to have that they might not know to answer or to ask uh, their coaches so i thought it was a really cool idea um so this is going to be a little bit different to the norm and instead of say touching on you know when we bring on clients we talk about how their transformation journey was we're actually going to talk about you know what to expect uh, what he should um prepare himself for and the different mindset that he should be using at different stages of the journey. So with that said, let's touch on, you know, we've, we've spoken about the education aspect that you want to, you want to kind of dial, dial yourself into, but what are the other goals that you have and what, you know, what was your why at the beginning of this journey, which you've started, uh, I think it's two weeks ago now. So as of rec- we're recording this at the end of December. So Mark started with us at the beginning of December. Uh, so he's still very new to the journey. Um, so it's all very fresh for him to, to talk about now. Yeah, yeah. And um, with a business background, I'm very used to key performance indicators, key business indicators. I'm very focused on and driven on goals. Um, but as I said, I, I'm, I'm also particularly humble as well. And I didn't actually really know what my goals were. I, I guess at a, at a very high level, absolutely, I was letting my kids down. Can I really look at my kids in the eye and, and think, you know, I, I, want, to, I want to walk both my daughters up the aisle, you know, in, in the future. Um, and I, I really was underperforming personally, to be honest, and, and not leading the best example. So that was a, a, a healthy motivator. Yes, I want, I want to be healthy, um, fit. I want to understand what my body really should be. Um, I want to fit into nice clothes. I'd, I'd actually like to have one wardrobe rather than wardrobe for when I'm plus three stone and a wardrobe when I'm minus three stone. Um, and, you know, when you plug your, your BMI into a, just a simple app, um, it's not pleasant to see that you're, um, you're in the top end of the amber or solidly into the red. Um, so a combination, combination of those factors. But what I am clear about is that I'm not clear on what my goals are. So if you said, you know, what's your weight target? And this is something Kanal and I are, are, are working on at the moment. Um, first stage is shed a load of weight, obviously, and I'm, I'm starting to do that quite well now. Um, but uh, I've been, in the last 15 years, I've never been below 92 kilos. Um, and I don't know what my, well, I haven't even, even heard of the, you know, the, the, the lean weight. Um, I, I don't know 
what I should be at. Is it 88? Is it 86? Is it 84? I, I really don't know. So I'm not hung up on on goals at the moment. I'm, let's let's Im- go full immersion into the process. That educate myself, keep it simple, uh, and the more detailed goals will will emerge in the coming weeks. And that's me putting my absolute faith and trust in in Canal, who I have to say has been absolutely special, really fantastic. Um, so uh, long may it continue. Amazing. And, and I agree with you in that the first thing you need to establish is why you're doing it. And you seem to have a, a good multi-layered why there, uh, which is going to help you a lot at the beginning and later on down the line. Because, you know, if you think about, okay, I want to be able to walk my daughters down the aisle in a healthy state and look good in the suit. That's going to keep you driven when, you know, when things get tough. Um, because like you said, you, you'll probably do it anyway, right? You'll, you'll, um, you'll starve yourself if needs be probably, but you want to now do this to a position where, you know, in, in 15 years time or whenever, whenever it may be, you can see you're still in that position. You don't have those two wardrobes. You're not, you know, when you step off the gas, it's not just the case of rebounding, right? Because I think from what I've, from what, you, from what you've told me, you've never really changed your diet, right? You've just, you just trained. Just, you just train and train and train. When, when you can burn five, six, seven, eight thousand calories a day, I've, I never really thought about what to eat. Yeah. So I mean, that's going to be the biggest, um, biggest education for you. And in terms of your, your way, where you're at now with the three stone, would you say the the reason you're here is because of that loss of uh, of that lack of exercise, or is there something else that? That's brought you to this position now where your weight's higher than it should be? Um, I think it's multifaceted. I mean, I, I've, I feel better now, even in the last couple of weeks. But, um, you know, going back to the end of November, why did I reach out? Um, firstly, I just felt, I felt awful. I felt as though the reasons I'd left corporate life, um, I was you know, very successful in business, everything's going fine. Um, but it, it had come at a cost and I was sacrificing some of my core principles of being healthy. Um, but I didn't, I'd lost my way, um, with my health. I didn't know how to, how to address that. Um, and I was starting to overcomplicate things in, in my mind. Um, I mean, no, no major issues. It wasn't particularly getting me down or anything, but it was something that I just absolutely, absolutely had to change. Um, and I had to reach out, and I decided to reach out. Uh, I, I got some great feedback from um, from Dick Sesh, reached out to you guys, and decided that well, absolutely, I'm just going to um, going to focus and um, I guess submit to to a process. Great. And how have your first two weeks been? How did you find the onboarding, getting started, and uh, you know the initial dive into the process? Main thing for me is I just needed to surrender to the to the process. Canal, I will do absolutely absolutely everything you ask. I'm just going to assume I don't know anything. And um, and one of the really refreshing things, and it, it's stunning in its simplicity, and that's keep it simple. Um, I was because I'm quite analytic, and I, I my mind's always working. You know, I love what I do, so I don't have a business and home life you know I'm always kind of thinking if you like in full immersion um and canal has been able to just take all the choices out of my life just tells me I just eat the same thing all the time um and I'm to the point now even after only two and a half weeks that I don't have to think what I'm doing it's it's been fantastic transformational for routine um for business nothing gets in the way of it to be honest um and uh, I'm I'm so thankful for for that progress. But that's how I approached it. It was to just say, "Look, well, I'll just do. You tell me." And because it's enough of this, um, I'm not. I don't want to do a diet. This is about uh, sustainability and transformation over the long term. Um, and actually, you know, I, I don't see this ending. To be honest, this is this is this will happen for years and years now. So I'm really looking forward to it. Amazing. The thing you touched on about taking all the choices out, I think can be one of the biggest game changers for everyone who starts the process, especially who people who have, um, who run their own businesses 
or work you know extremely long hours and have many different hats to juggle because it's something I top, touch on regularly and it's a it's a thing called decision fatigue which I'm sure you've heard of and it's about cutting out all the menial decisions in your life and just to save willpower and to save creative capacity in your brain for things that do require you know brain power and one of the one of the menial decisions can be just what you eat in the day and if you can cut out you know what you're going to eat for breakfast what you're going to eat for lunch are you going to have chicken and, or turkey for dinner are you going to have rice or sweet potato if you can cut all these menial decisions out you save all that willpower reserve and it allows you to you know save mental energy for areas in your life which you know do require more creative uh, creative capacity such as you know business and you know spending time with your family and i think just cutting those decisions out, taking all the thinking out, can be such a game changer uh, for any, for anyone achieve, uh, trying to go for anything. Yeah, yeah, it, it's and that has been that little golden nugget that I really seized on it. It was so simple. Um, another thing can I'll mention, which um, just kind of out of the blue, and I'm not, I don't even know whether he knew what he was saying, but he said, even if you're uh, going to the supermarket just just park in the other end of the uh, the car park and, and about 200 yards to the to the superstore and i do that so often now in in my life and then, um it's just those little little things and they just really help um and uh you know that gets me my steps in and i'm it's de-stressing my life a bit well actually because i'm not cute trying to get in the car parking space outside the supermarket door you know it's little things like that yeah so you've spoken on some of the the big benefits you've already seen what are some of the struggles you've you've accounted at the beginning or has it been all plain sailing <laughs> no i don't i don't think anything when you're making such large changes i don't think it's all plain sailing um the uh oh, the, my muscles ached for the first week they they really did um and I just I stuck with it. Um, again, just reaching out to Canal, just know what was going on. And he said, just stick with it. And uh, sure enough, after five or six days, you know that that subsided. Um, hunger um, was probably the the biggest adjustment. But again, it only took four, five, six days, and I was I was in a rhythm. Um, uh, just a few couple of things like uh, that I've just had to alter slightly. So mixing the whey protein with my porridge, I just, it was disgusting. I, I just didn't like that. So just quite simply just split the two, you know, just have my porridge there and have a whey protein drink. Um, and I found that was great because the whey protein drink just became a, a hunger suppressant. Um, and it just kind of splits things up uh, a little bit for me, um, and it, it makes it more flexible as well. I've done something I haven't done in ten years, and I now make a pat lunch um, to keep myself uh, accountable. I've never, never really done that, um, but just doing those—it's small little things. Um, uh, but you know, it's, it's been wonderful, and the results are, are just starting to show as well. Yeah, how have you found it um, integrating it with family life? Uh, how are they being supportive? Uh, is it easy for them to to get on board with? Yeah, yeah, very supportive. Um, but you can appreciate as as a family, <laughs> we've got four children. They're they're eight, eleven, fifteen, and eighteen. An important part of family life is the six of us all coming together at the end of the day and having a chat around the family meal table. Um, and for for dad to be off making his his own food and and everybody else eating uh eating a different type of food um my my wife is um she's really looking forward to the new year i think this is um you know the inspiration and feedback that i've been giving her i think that'll be uh part of the inspiration for her to to maybe do this um starting in in january um but the the type of food that we've got as a family, we just we love healthy stuff. So you know, chicken salad as an example. Um, 
well, if I'm having it, well, why can't everybody have it? Um, now, the kids don't want chicken salad every day, so we just have to be a bit sparing. So they're just getting into that routine of a slightly different family shop, and um, and that's where the batch cooking really helps. I wish, I, again, something I've never done batch cooking before. I'll be honest, I'm not very creative at it at the moment, um, so uh, I need to get a few spices and things like that and uh, and jazz it up a little bit but uh, that'll come yeah how are you batch cooking right now are you doing once a week or daily um, about about twice a week about about twice a week and and at the moment it's uh, again not very sophisticated it's it's mainly just, uh, you know getting two or three packs of chicken and you know batching that that chicken up um for for my wife and I, so we tend to both together during the day um, with the chicken, and uh, yeah, that lasts sort of three or four days, and um, and then do it again. Um, I don't batch cook the um, most of what I eat. I enjoy eating it, you know, broccoli, uh, um, mange, to, you know, anything in green veg and uh, um, spinach and things. So that's easy just to take out the fridge, prepare. Really. Oh, I, Great. I mean, batch cook as well. Yeah, batch cooking makes such a difference on uh, time management as well, which is uh, a big part of balancing all the different elements. If you can kind of get the batch cooking, get the meals prepped in advance, it will save so much time and, and mental energy again because you know you wake up and you know everything's already done for you, and you just need to get on get on with the day. And when it comes time to eat, you can just take out the relevant food, eat it, and and carry on. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was, uh, it was fine. It's, it's been a been a game changer, to be honest. Um, time is is my most precious precious asset. I've always got something on the go, and I really don't want to be stood in front of the Arga doing the, uh, the the cooking for the hours a day. That's for sure. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, let's flip the script now, and I think I know you have some questions for me as as a from a client's perspective, and I think this will be really interesting for other for listeners to hear this. So. You know, I'm going to leave this to you now. <laughs> so I don't know what I'm opening myself up to here, but uh, if you want to take the to rain the reins and uh, and ask me what you you want to ask at this stage of the journey, and I know you have some questions prepared, so go ahead. Yeah, so I think um, my first question was was about goals, but I I felt uh, I felt a bit uncertain about setting those goals, and I I felt I needed to know what the end goal was and you mentioned the why i'm very clear on my why um and i just had that initial uncertainty of well i don't i don't know my body well enough to have goals so i just wonder how how the coming weeks months um presumably we'll be setting different goals um and changing those goals as we as we proceed the biggest goal that you have right now is is building habits building lifestyle habits that you can stack on top of each other, you know, one by one and enable you to in the future be able to set more hardline goals. Because if you've got a long journey ahead of you, the worst thing you can do is say to yourself, right, I'm going to drop 30 kilos in, in the next year. It's just so, it's so big and it's so difficult to kind of, you know, encapsulate that it's just going to set yourself up for failure. Whereas if you can say to say to yourself, okay, in month one, I'm going to focus on, you know, eating protein at each meal, uh, having three liters of water a day, reaching eight to 10,000 steps a day, weight training four days a week, whatever your, your kind of targets are in each week. If you can set those in habits uh, every week, every day, then after a month one, you may be down, you, know, you may be down four to six kilos and you may tell yourself, okay, now, now I'm on track and, you know, this is a lot more doable. And then I'd say to yourself, okay, in month two, I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to aim for another three kilos of body weight, and then whatever Kunal set you in that in the in the in that month, say to yourself, okay, these are the targets I'm going to hit every day, and just and, and by that you could just stack habits on top of on top of each other, and the next thing you know, you'll be in a position where you can say to yourself, okay, now in the next three months, I'm going to really go for it, and I'm going to drop ten kilos, and that will get me to my goal weight for the time being. That's really really helpful taking it in in phases and uh, yeah. i think 
you know, will, will take me through that. And as I say, he's been brilliant so far. I'm really looking forward to, to that relationship with him as he can draw out what those goals are. Because my goal to me, it might be if I get to 90 kilos, well, that's, that's probably the lowest weight I've been in 15 years. But that leaves so much on tap potential. Um, mm. And, you know, my philosophy of getting to the bottom of my reserve tank, well, it needs to be done in a, in a sustainable way this time. Um, so, okay, that's, that's really... Uh, what is your great. height, Mark? I'm 5'11". Okay, so at 5'11", let's say, for example, you wanted to get a six-pack at some point. It, it would be a lot lower than 90 kilos for you. Yeah. So at 5'11", you're looking at anywhere between 70 to 80 kilos for a six-pack, depending on what your muscle mass is right now uh, and what it gets to. It'll be in that range of 70 to 80 kilos. So there is a lot of untapped potential that you do have and you probably don't realize how far you can take this. Yeah. You know, you've been to 90 kilos in the past, but there's, there's a lot more there for you, for 100%. Which is yeah. exciting at the same time. And yeah, massively, and that that's where I just know I I need need help, and and in getting that's uncharted territory um, for me with a with a busy you know busy life as well, and and that probably leads on to another point of there's that uncertainty of I don't know what I don't know, and what's been very revealing at the moment is the the simplicity of the process, but that first week or so, um, there's a lot to think about, you know, um, from an education point of view, I'm thinking nutrition, now taking, um, you know, some of the, uh, supplements, which I've never taken before, um, which of, you know, D3 and, and the like, which are all fine. Whey protein, what's whey protein, you know, literally starting from basics and, um, very humble that I really didn't know a great deal. And um and and portion control. Oh my goodness. I mean that is just earth shattering to me. It's um the amount of water you can lose out of cooking uh, a breast of chicken and uh it's all these little things, you know, I'm I'm fascinated. I'm just hoovering it out. It's lovely. It's it's amazing how uh your portion size has become when you actually weigh your food, right? You never have, you never realize what, say, 200, 150 grams of chicken actually is when it's raw weight. Yeah. It's become so little. And I think weighing, weighing everything at the beginning is so, so important to, to have that realization of what proper portion control should be. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, the rice, the porridge, the chicken, um, but I've, I've also liked that flexibility as well, where you know spinach or broccoli or whatever, you know, kind of have a have as much of that as you like. And there have been a couple of times where I've probably felt as though I need to better self-administer that, and I was probably taking that a bit too liberally, certainly in the first week, um, where eat as much as you like. But actually, I don't want to eat too much of that, so I've paired that. Not right back down now, but I've found a nice moderate level. And I think one of the things that has changed in week two into week three is um, I've got the standard routine, but um, I'm now consistent as well in in my food portions. Um, and, uh, yeah, that was something I hadn't really appreciated before. So uh, consistency. In terms of your initial question in regards to you know, not knowing what you don't know and trying to uh, do everything at once, I'd say the biggest piece of advice I have, which sort of links to the first, the first question you had is don't chase perfection. And don't think you need to get every single thing right in that first few weeks. It's not going to be a case of going from your old habits to new habits overnight. It's very much, it's very much a journey. And the more you appreciate that it is a journey and that it's okay to not get it all right at the beginning, you know, the easier it can be mentally to then take it on, take on new habits uh, as you go along. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's been a, a complete transformation for me. Um, and I do have a thirst for, for, for the knowledge. Um, having a coffee with, with Dick Sesh, he was uh, telling me about the different types of, of, of body and you might be one of three different types, which again is that's all a mystery to to me at the moment but but all in good time 
So I guess one of the questions is, how can I become more educated and, and find, find out more about my own body, um, but also preserving that return on time invested? Because I've not got unlimited amounts of time. I'll create time for the areas of education that I, I need to. So what can I read? Where can I? I mean, your podcasts have been absolutely brilliant, to be honest. Lots of golden nuggets in there. But I appreciate any other any yeah. other golden nuggets. So when it comes to education, I think the, the important thing is not to spread yourself too thin with it and, and start reading about everything because that can become, you know, that can almost become counterproductive. And I would, I would yeah, because then you start, you read conflicting advice and then you start questioning yourself and you start questioning the process and think, hold on, so this thing's not right. Uh, this, this person says this and this person says that. And that's, I think, channeling it down to just one source. And obviously, I'm going to be biased, but it makes sense for you to just immerse yourself into the podcast, into our, uh, into our articles that we release every week and, and just immerse yourself into one kind of, one source of education because for you, you're not someone who's in the field. So you don't need to have, you know, a very, very broad knowledge. You just want to know what works in the real world. And you just want to be able to execute on a daily basis without taking away um, your mental energy units for business and for family life. So I think if you can just focus on what's important and listen to one source of information and, you know, if, if that's us, then it makes sense for it to be us. Uh, then it will just allow you to, you know, stay focused and, and know that what you're doing is, is all part of the process. And that way you'll become educated in, in why we do certain things. But beyond that, I'd also, you know, use Kunal's expertise to always ask him questions. That's a good way of uh, learning and probably the best way to learn for your specific body type. And the third thing I'd say is, is stay self-aware with yourself. Meaning, you know, if you, for example you eat a certain type of food and it doesn't react well with you, then that's education. You know, that's learning that, okay, this food doesn't work for me. Or maybe I need to try, I need to tell Kunal, and then, or maybe I need to just try a different food, which, you know, so if it's say chicken, you don't feel good on chicken, okay, I'm going to try turkey. This feels better. That's educating yourself on your body. And, and that's something that a lot of people don't pay attention enough to, and that's your own body's biofeedback. And the more you can stay in tune with your body, the, the more educated you become on your own specific body because we're all very different. And, you know, with everything you've put yourself through in the last 30 years with your body, only you're going to have the symptoms that you have. So the more in tune you can be with yourself and listening to how it, how it feels when you do a certain exercise or how it feels after a certain meal, the better not only your education will be, but also the coaching process because you'll be able to give better feedback to Canal to hit for them, for them, him to guide you on the next steps very good very good i mean this uh, gives me a great pathway um for the future um and i i guess leads me on to the next question was you know there's going to be some pretty massive transformation at, at, at my humble level um and it's how i how i it's like a, I see it as almost a giant flywheel. And at the moment, I'm just trying to get the giant flywheel turning. And once it turns, how do I then convert that massive transformation into not just the initial six months, but beyond that, 12, 18, 24 months, you know, year? It needs to be in perpetuity as far as I'm concerned. Now. Yeah. It, it needs to be seamless with your lifestyle. That's really the key. If you put everything on hold and only do fitness for six months then as soon as you go back to your normal life it's all going to fall apart it has to be it really does have to be a balance and it does have to be a lifestyle choice that you make whereby the habits that you implement cater for your family time cater for your business time so you know when when you do step off the gas a little bit or you know you say you in six months time you have that six pack for example you can still maintain it afterwards it's not a case of okay, now I've got my six pack, let me just go back to no living normally and everything just slowly falls apart, which has happened in the past for you. So it's, it's critical that it becomes a sustainable solution that is built on your lifestyle and it becomes seamless with it. I mean, of course, at the beginning, there are going to have to be changes that you make that are a little bit drastic uh, just because your previous lifestyle habits weren't catering towards your goals. But once you've uh, you know, built those initial kind of rocks in, in, in those habits, then 
it's a case of making sure that these are sustainable ones you can carry through and very much in tune with your lifestyle in all assets or in all facets of it yeah yeah and 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 again a, a very nice lead into to my final question which is um what has been involved in trying to inspire the the younger generation and obviously that starts at a time you know close time with that with our four children and um it's not easy sometimes with the age groups from age eight, seven, fifteen, and, and eighteen um, to you know get get them involved if you like um, through food and sensible choices, um, and that's that is my why my, my my family and I guess it will be for for many of your members. Um, any thoughts on how we can make that more sustainable? Yeah. Um... So I'm a big fan in you know cre- creating generational health here, and, and that's exactly what you're going to be doing here. And there's a couple of different strategies I've seen that worked in uh, other in other people in your situation. And the first one, of course, is lead by example, and and that's you know if when they see a transformation in yourself, that will inspire them to make better lifestyle choices or you know push themselves in in other areas of their life. And and I do think there's there's something to be said for you know, leading from the front. And you know this is, as a business leader that it's the best way to inspire action is through yourself. So this will be a big game changer for you in that, you know, a couple of months down the line when they see, you know, you're leading up, you're, 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 more, energy, you're more energetic, you're more productive, that they'll think, okay, this is, this is great. I, I need to follow in my dad's footsteps here. That will be the first one. Uh, the second one would be um, get them involved as well. You know, whether that be going for family walks, uh, finding more, activity-based things to do as a family or whether it's cooking together, uh, eating maybe the meals that you're eating in a, as, a, as a family meal more often. So maybe you, know, you have your chicken salad but make it nicer than you do <laughs> and then make it more appealing for them. And, and you know, as a family, all eat similar foods. That, you know, that, that, can, that can work. You know, it might take some persuading but after they see you, you know, leading from the front per se, then they may be inspired to do the same in um, – making better choices at dinner time. So that would be my second thing is, you know, get them involved with, with uh, family walks, uh, whether you go for a run together or whether you even, you know, your older boys, you might want to take them to the gym. And that could be a great way of just getting the whole family involved and inspiring that next generation that you talked about. Yeah, my, uh, my eldest at 18, he said, you know, Dad, I, I really want to do something together with you. I'm thinking, oh, it's, it's, it's great. It's what every, every dad wants to hear from his son. I said, what did you have in mind? He said, um, I'd like to go boxing with you, Dad. <laughs> so, so we're in the, in the new year. Um, yeah, once a week, we're going to go down to the, the boxing gym and do a bit of sparring and skipping and everything else there. And uh, I'll let Kunal know and we'll, we'll build that into the schedule. But again, taking your advice, it's a, it's a great way of engaging them and doing something together. I'm just has so many so many benefits yeah huge and, and that's, that's exactly it i mean then what you've what you're doing there or what your son suggested is is exactly the way it should be and that that's that's something that's sustainable for your lifestyle and that's very much part of it if you can build that boxing into your weekly routine with your son it's going to make it a lot easier to stay fitter in, in the long run and it's going to inspire action in himself to you know just make sure he he takes on healthy healthy habits in the future yeah well, if I can take all those um, golden nuggets of advice um, and uh, with Kunal's support, um, I just can't wait to see the transformation continue over over the next uh, months and months to come. It's, um, it's going to be exciting times. It is very exciting. And, you know, you said to me in an email, um, hopefully you can draw out my biggest strength on the podcast. And I think you've repeatedly said it yourself already, and I haven't really had to draw it out, and it's your drive. You know, it's your relentless drive to become a better person or in whatever you do. And that's going to carry you all the way. There's, there's no doubt about it. And if you can just trans, transfer the drive you have in business, in family, you know, in, tra- in your previous training endeavors into, into this body transformation, it'll be a breeze. No. And uh, I've got no doubt in that you're going to, you're going to get an amazing transformation. Well, it's, uh, I, I certainly, uh, I'm 100% certain of that. Um, 
the how isn't so clear to me at the moment. Um, but number one for me is just do whatever Kunal says and put my faith in the system. And uh, already I can now start to see the difference. Weight's coming down, waistline's coming down, um, you know, all those factors there. And, um, and I'm feeling really, I'd say comfortable, but uncomfortable, if you know what I mean, in a, in a positive way. Um, you know, starting to bed in and becoming just second nature, really, which, uh, which is great. Which is great. Yeah. Once the habits stack and this becomes second nature to your lifestyle, it will become a lot easier to see the how. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm patient. I'm humble. I'm patient. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. So uh, I've been to the gym this morning. I've got, got that done for the day. Enjoyed it. I'm about to go out to a meeting now, which I'm going to walk to in the village, um, get my steps in uh, and just... Uh, just a couple of examples around just building that change into into everyday everyday life. Perfect. That's um. It, it, before we finish off, is there anywhere um that anywhere that people can find you? Um. Yeah. If you want to learn more about your your business, your book, uh, anything else? Yeah, I'm um, pretty active on on Facebook, um, uh, LinkedIn, a little bit on Instagram. My my. Two boys, um, they tend to roll their eyes when dad's on Instagram, but uh, they get into themselves on that. Um, I've got my own website, uh, which is markstokesuk.com. Um, so you can have a look at some of the stuff we're doing. There's a bit of my background on there as well. Um, and then obviously my, my search my my book on, on Amazon if, if that's... Uh, that's of interest. There's a lot about me and, and my drive in that as well and how we've applied that in our development business. And, um, yeah, my, my energies over Christmas uh, and to the new year will be focused on, on my new book. So I'll, I'll let people know on probably on Facebook initially what that's going to be in January. So, uh, yeah, please reach out, PM me, and um, more, than, more than happy to uh, strike up conversations, meet new people. After all, this has come about from reaching out with, uh, with Dick Sesh over the last uh, couple of years, uh, who has just been through an amazing transformation with you guys. I mean, he should be so proud of himself. It's quite incredible. Amazing. He's, uh, he's really pushed himself hard, and I'm excited to see what he brings in March. Yeah. Uh, he's just got a big, uh, big deadline for March uh, for his fiftieth. So I'm, yeah. I'm excited for it. He has, yes, yes. Yeah. Great. Good. And um, we're, without, without Dick, Se- except for Dick Sesh, because we know we're going to bring him on the podcast anyway. Who would you like to see on the podcast next? Oh. Um, probably uh, Kunal. Actually, uh, a real deep, in-depth session with Carl, so I can. Uh, really understand him more he's got so much experience there and he's got such a wonderful way of uh, of expressing himself uh, i've i've heard him on i think you had a, a group um a group hug together um three or four of you um but uh, i i think a real detailed uh, session yes. there that would fascinate me yeah, that's something we've we keep we always we meet up very regularly and we always say, okay, we're gonna do a podcast today, we're gonna do a podcast today. For some reason we haven't done it. So that's something I'm, I need to get done over the Christmas period. That's uh, it's a good reminder there, yeah. <laughs> Look forward to it. Awesome. Is there anything else you'd like to finish on? No, uh, not at all. Apart from you know, a big thank you. Um I can feel massive changes in my life already. Um I have to say, what what a great community! I've listened to probably a dozen of the, your podcasts so far, and the the, the Facebook uh, group is brilliant. Everyone's so supportive, welcoming, and and just lots of tips for for the new beginner, just to get over that kind of confidence and just check you're on the uh, uh, on the, the right path. So, uh, yeah, thank you to you, Akash, for having me on the the podcast and uh, for creating such a great business and a great community. It's really appreciated. It makes a difference to a lot of people. Absolute pleasure. Thank, thank you so much. Great. So if you've enjoyed today's episode with Mark and you know other people who'd be inspired to take action just like he has, uh, then please share it with your family and friends. Uh, for more information, please visit www.rntfitness.co.uk. Uh, to follow us on social media, please visit at rnt underscore fitness or at Akash Vigela on Instagram. And uh, yeah, thank you, for, uh, thank you for listening. I'll speak to you soon. 